Cool. So we're now recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Package Manager's Weekly Sync for the 5th of March 2019. Uh, I am Alex Bosides. I am your host. Uh, we're going to play the game of what I did last week, what I'm blocked on, and what I'm going to do next. Uh, does anybody want to volunteer to be a note taker? Thanks, Jim. Cool. Uh, so, what have I been doing? All right, so uh, I've been on holiday, um, so I haven't actually done very much. Um, I found a problem with uh, MPN IPFS where the pub sub mechanism that it used to broadcast updates of new modules would just stop working after a while. Turns out there's a, um, a magic number that is how big a pub sub message can be. Um, and if you send a message that's bigger than that to subscribers, they will disconnect from you. Uh, I didn't see that documented anywhere, but there was a uh, an issue um, that said that it might be a good idea. So it seems like someone's implemented it uh, without documenting it. Uh, Vashko is going to have a look into uh, the implementation to see where that's actually set because he's not sure uh, and get it to throw an appropriate error message if you are the um, if you're if you're about to send a message that's going to cause people to disconnect from you. Um, it's not going to stop uh, malicious clients doing it, obviously, but you know, to, to the developer who's trying to do the right thing, it'll be nice for them to know sooner rather than later. Um, yeah, that's it. I'm not blocked on anything. Uh, next, I'm, I need to start working on my OKR. I realized I haven't really done anything um, towards my, well, not very much towards my OKRs because I've been kind of consumed by a lot of the package manager stuff. Uh, so that's probably going to be me for the next week. Anybody got any questions? What, what are your OKRs? Uh, are they, they, they are, that can be shared or are they just personal things? No, no, they, um, I think they can be shared. Yeah, they can be shared. Um, it's uh, things like adding missing features to IPFS. Uh, well, actually, I was trying, you know, trying to add support to Tink for uh, IPFS, which then turned out to be adding support to NPM itself for IPFS because Tink just uses NPM CLI to install dependencies. Uh, and I kind of got so far down that hole that it, it was clear that it would require more work than... I imagine the NPM team would be willing to accept without kind of prior consultation, you know, because they want their inputs into how they do it. Because there's no, uh, there's no like kind of notion of different transports like you have in, in apt or anything like that. It's just like <laughs> HTTP all over the place. Um, you know, so like you, for example, like you have this, these modules that uh, will return HTTP responses and then the consumer of that will start looking at like headers and, and that kind of thing in the response to extract metadata that it will use to process the, the dependency. Um, so there's not a nice, like clear separation uh, between the transport and the, and the data. Um, so that kind of thing would need a bigger refactor, which is kind of beyond the scope of what I was trying to do. That's fair. <laughs> cool, that is me. Um, Andrew? Okay, so I've had uh, some fun this week whilst Alex has been away. I uh, merged a couple of pull requests that I had opened last week to add a glossary and a list of package managers to the package manager repository. Uh, and then I actually managed to implement um, IPFS support in Homebrew. Uh, I've not sent a pull request yet because uh, I I did share the, um, the work that I've done with uh, Mike McQuaid and he said that it would be unlikely that they would merge a IPFS transport until the package that ha had its primary source available uh, requiring IPFS which was interesting because IPFS is a homebrew formula um, so there might be a lever that could be used to uh, to kind of bend that slightly um, it actually turned out to be quite easy. Homebrew already has a number of different transports that you can use to, uh, I'll paste a link actually in the chat here as well, um, to uh, make different kinds of checkouts. Uh, it uses the original URL and then you basically would add the hash in as an extra argument. And if that hash is available, it will try and download it via IPFS. And then the nice thing about Homebrew is that you can fork the whole registry 
and add that in so we could potentially have um uh, a fairly simple way of saying like brew install ipfs slash core slash package name and have that uh pulled from ipfs assuming that we've backed all of those formulas somewhere so that there's always someone seeding them um the only real area that's not supported from the end user's point of view is bottles which are the pre-built binaries but i don't believe that would be too hard to add in because they use the same transport underlying transport mechanism so adding like the same ipfs transport will be available for use for the bottles it's just that the URLs aren't declared, they're inferred uh, because they only use one source for the bottles, which is the or the built-in one, which is the homebrew bin tray. And then Linux brew uses like bin tray under Linux brew rather than homebrew as a different name. Um, so that would be fairly easy to add in. The 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 area that would be more difficult to make it like especially full ipfs is cloning the homebrew formula repository uh, from ipfs rather than from github because it is a gigantic repository um and it is like 200 and something megabytes so there could end up being some files that were uh, rather large there and making that work with the existing git uh it basically it always clones the or like shallow clones the latest version of the repository so the, don't, they don't have the same kind of different ways of transporting their registry around which means we can't just pluck like a, a copy of the file system as a, like the latest checkout which is a bit of a shame um but it might be doable but it's also kind of the th kind of thing that you could step into it um Yes, Jim, I did uh, check out Git on IPFS. There's a tricky limitation with the number, of, uh, the, the maximum size of a file that that gets into like the the problem of um, trying to make it like say that you can do Git clone with IPFS as the transport rather than uh, just like checking out or uh, like downloading a Git repository that happens to be on IPFS. Um, but I think there's things that can be done there and it doesn't have to necessarily be all uh, all in straight away. So it might be interesting to try and add more, basically write a script that would go through the formulas, add them all to IPFS and commit the hashes to a fork uh, that then someone could use instead. And Mike McQuaid, the homebrew maintainer, seemed pretty open like and interested in it rather than kind of dismissive uh and it's it's it, there might be an option to do that there um what else did i do i also spent some time reworking or writing out a different approach to categorization which is grouped by implementation from ipfs standpoint and that basically groups three different um categorizations that are quite, quite closely matched to my previous categorizations of um, multi-registry, centralized registry, portable registry. Uh, the main groupings being file system based, which is most system package managers. That's probably because uh, rsync works really well for keeping mirrors of those things um, that they can literally just treat everything as a file in the file system. Copying that around is actually fairly easy, but it means that their, all their metadata is stored in files. Uh, Maven and CPAN also work like that. Then you've got the database back ones, which tend to be more modern and have like a SQL or like some kind of web application with database that is doing authentication and like handling the transformation of packages. Usually it means that it's quite self-service. You don't need to get someone to add the uh, packages to the file system yourself, which happens on Maven, for example, you need to send your package to uh, Maven Central and say, can you publish this? Um, whereas most of the database ones don't require the sharing, like don't require someone else to be available for you to publish your package. But the downside is that it's not anywhere near easy 
to, uh, to mirror that because you need a copy of the database, you need to run the web application server, uh, or you need to make something that pretends to be the web application server. And all, or at least I haven't seen any kind of shared um, API spec that is used between different registries. They all implement their own wonderful, unique JSON or XML, or uh, in the case of the closure registry, closure uh, over HTTP um, to talk to their individual clients. And then the, uh, yeah, I can see Michael laughing. It is, it was ridiculous wow. to try and actually like execute that. Um, you get given back closure maps, which are data, uh, and you can load up enclosure, but it's, it's really not very nice to try and work with it if you're not writing your parser or your, your client enclosure. And then the, uh, the third one is Git based, which kind of two different kinds. The portable registries end up being using Git as a database, uh, where they're putting history of, um, all of the things that are published, usually just the metadata directly into a file system like, um, very similar shape to the file system registries, uh, except for then they're versioned, uh, almost always to use GitHub as the infrastructure so they don't have to host their own databases and be their own DBAs. Uh, but also that then you have some kind of history of versioning, which requires a lot more implementation if you're going to do it yourself. So it's, it's kind of like the lazy maintainer's way, which is totally reasonable. It does mean that when you get to like homebrew size and history, you can't actually view the history of any one package in Git because GitHub just is like, no, this times out, this takes way too long to, uh, to step through the Git history. Uh, but there's some interesting things there. Also notice that apart from homebrew, most of those all have a database as well to power their web applications. Homebrew actually exports their registry into JSON files and puts it on GitHub pages so that you can, um, like you don't have to use Git as a database in production because that ends up uh, being incredibly slow in general. And then the registry one, registry list style Git uh, registries are basically like, like um, Go or Swift or Carthage where you just point your, there's no namespace. The namespaces are URLs on the internet that point to Git repositories and the history of the versions is stored inside each one of those Git repositories. So the actual um, dependency resolution ends up being quite slow because you're cloning recursive uh, Git repositories and trawling their history of their tags or their Git commits, maybe on different branches as well. Um, but it ends up being like there's no, there's no requirement for anyone to um, check anything when any new published package goes out. So there's very little in the way of gatekeepers, uh, which is what, uh, I mean, Go comes from the, like, everything is going to be vended anyway inside of Google. Uh, this also happens to work for other people, maybe, uh, and they're slowly bringing it back to being useful for people outside of, uh, outside of Google, but it's still in flux a lot. Whereas Swift and Carthage are much more stable. They're not changing on a regular basis. Um, they're all susceptible to the repositories going away or repository being forced pushed to. Uh, some of them will keep track of what the repositories looked like last time that they talked to them and other ones won't. Um, so that's kind of gives an interesting way of thinking about when we come to solve a problem for one of the registries on IPFS that potentially that maps to uh, like the, we can document that process and then go, oh, this can also be used for all of these other kinds that work very similarly, assuming the clients are going to have their own um, implementations and things, but from the IPFS mapping of like file system, or we got to, we got to keep some kind of database on here, or at least the pretend database of the results of the API, uh, on a path that um, might make it slightly easier or at least chunk it up to when tackling each individual thing. Uh, what else did I do? Also just put out, just opened an issue about getting this working group public. Um, 
it's really more of a discussion start point as the links in the crit pad and it's on the um the github repository just thinking about like are there any steps that we need to do before we can start having these uh discussions in public so we can point people there uh, i tried to organize a call with someone in new zealand and it's actually really hard to to schedule a time that's not for one of us like 3 a.m uh, so i thought oh well, it'd be much easier if we could do this asynchronously on on a um a a document that was on github uh and the other thing tiny little thing as i was learning about homebrew and how that worked i found uh the ipfs package depended on uh, a number of things that weren't actually used because IPFS is makefile bootstraps itself via IPFS through the gateway. It doesn't actually use GX uh, when it's building. It downloads its own copy of GX. So I was able to remove um, three different dependencies from the homebrew formula. So anyone who installs IPFS via homebrew now has uh, it's just much faster because they're not pulling down dependencies that never get used. Uh, and that got accepted along with a number of other fixes that I found for formulas that do some go basically implements its own wrappers around package managers it doesn't trust python uh and go being the two that i've stumbled across where they're like we'll put in and every individual uh top level or potentially even transitive dependency as um git repositories in our homebrew formula and they will be cloned into the path they're expecting to be once the package manager would have finished doing what it's doing so that a formula is repeatable rather than being changed every time that the um, the bottle server would build, uh, which is quite interesting as a as a bit of a crutch that they, they basically work around how other package managers work. Um, although Homebrew has its own problems with that where they're basically always like, it, it's really only supported on the latest version of anything and previous versions are, are considered to be unsupported. Um, but uh, that also, Built up a bit of goodwill with the homebrew people uh, when it comes to actually like saying, "Hey, we should get this IPFS stuff implemented." Do you reckon uh, adding, like, making the IPFS homebrew, uh, you know, install require IPFS is too cheeky to get IPFS as a transport <laughs> into homebrew? Ah. Uh... Yes, <laughs> pretty cheeky. Like it's it's literally the worst pattern. The bootstrap uh, there is might be too pretty easy. painful. But if you're just like, mm, how do we get the first time around? Uh, is is slightly painful. It's more like we're going to need to uh, have this as this is a good transport, and this is what the IPFS project says the best way to download it is. Uh, even if the first time you're going to download it over HTTP through the gateway rather than uh, rather than having to somehow find the IPFS binary to be able to install the IPFS binary. Michael? Yeah, uh, so one, so in, in the sort of category of package managers where we can probably sort of take the database and run with it, um, one thing that I worry about um, is a lot of times that the way that they that you export or that you get a feed of that data is somewhat out of date or it eventually becomes out of date this actually happened with npm so like initially the feed that you would use to sort of replicate the database um, was the live database and then as they scaled up that changed and it went from being like a couple seconds behind to now they're literally different systems and because the updates are so fast it's like 10 minutes behind so it's still a really good option if we want to build like an offline capable version of the package manager like we can we can pull the data and we can turn it into IPLD terms or whatever we need to do to, to move the data around um, but if we're doing sort of like live package installs we always have to hit that live API, because if you just published a package and then you try to install it, you won't get it, right? Um, unless we always hit that live one when you actually have a connection. Yeah, there's all of the database package managers are gonna have a similar problem. Like NPM is actually pretty reasonable for getting data out. Some of them don't even have RSS feeds or any way of saying, is there a new package here? Uh, you literally have to trawl through maybe even paginate a list of HTML <laughs> links on a page to find out if there is a new thing. So 
those ones, I think the kind of approaches, there's two approaches I can see. One is going to be like, we actually get IPFS support directly in the production registry, like API. So it's, it's doing the work of, oh, I've, I've published a new package. I've also uh, announced it and added it to IPFS and added the, um, the CID into my database and it's available via the API. And the other way is the kind of artifactory style proxy uh, that's gonna lazily go to the registry and ideally like have uh, enough caching or like IPFS back caching that it can go offline or it can be lazy with the way that it's doing. But yeah, you, you're not able to, they also, there's no, there's often no, like, I think NPM just recently added the ability to roll back in time and say, oh, I, I want packages from before this date. Um, most of them don't have that, uh, that kind of like, ability to it's always assumed that you're running on the bleeding edge of the registry and things may or may not work um otherwise the interesting uh one there that stands out to me is the r community has a, a package manager called cran and their package manager doesn't allow you to pin the um uh the latest uh, it, you basically can't say there's a a maximum version number in that means you always pick up the newest version. There's no way of saying you don't want that. Uh, and so the community roots around that by making a snapshot of the registry every single day. Uh, this is funded, hosted by Microsoft. Uh, it's called MRAN uh, for Microsoft CRAN. And so you can actually point your registry. When you say, I want to install all the packages for this R program, you save the day that you want to install it on and everyone then basically freezes their whole community in time because they can't they can't back out of a, a broken new version. Uh, you can only roll forwards, um, and that's not really an acceptable way of doing it. So that IPFS has the like the ideal copy there to go. Well, you can always roll back to a previous, especially if we're using a kind of like some top level root that holds all of the metadata you can always point back to a previous version of that metadata, assuming that someone else is hosting it or has made it available or that you're, I guess you become responsible for your own metadata at some point. I think we should like really be shooting for the first option where we get people to add CIDs directly to the metadata of the actual registries that we're trying to, you know, we're trying to target. Cause we've got, I mean, we've got this NPM and IPFS thing and to be honest, it really shouldn't exist. You know, because it's yeah. we have to maintain, we have to write it, we have to maintain it, we have to host it. You know, whereas if the actual registries were just adding IPFS support, then that would be way better. I think that, like, in order to to get them to take that, though, we have to show the value first, and so we we're going to have to at least for some period it's of time a have a translation layer just to show them. Yeah, um, like so. But speaking of immutability, so. How many package manager registries have any kind of immutability guarantee in the metadata? Like um, any anything, like a SHA or anything. <laughs> Jim? Yeah. Jim, did you? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, you're, you're muted. muted, dude. I think you must be muted like on your mic or something because it doesn't say that you're muted in Zoom. Wrong mic, maybe. He's not said anything yeah. on this call yet. Hello? Yeah, it's got a... Yeah. There you go. Hey, there you go. I didn't know it was so quiet. Let <laughs> <laughs> um, someone else answer Michael's question. Um, so a good number of package managers have some kind of SHA-256 on individual packages, but very few have any kind of... Um, like... The, the metadata is often seen as almost ephemeral. Uh, it's quite difficult. It, the ones that do have it are uh, Nicks and Geeks. So that's basically okay. like we take snapshots of everything all the time. And um, Timeless Stack obviously also has that. Eric's just quietly uh, lurking down there on the bottom. Um, and I guess you kind of, you have it halfway with 
with the get backed ones, but you're you're hoping like that a lot of the get back ones will have the metadata stored in a, an immutable way, but they point at HTTP URLs on S3 or randomly on the like homebrew points at whoever is hosting the source originally, which could be some university or it could be anything. It doesn't mean I can roll back six months and all of the URLs on all of those formulas will will resolve correctly. So you're not going to have that like nice way of um, being able to snapshot and roll back the whole thing, uh, which is why you see lots of companies use, I think, uh, Artifactory and things like that because they want to be able to freeze the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or vendor, literally vendor every string, everything straight into your mono repo is the other way of guaranteeing that. Uh, but you lose a lot of of uh, tooling in the process. Yeah. A couple minutes left. Any other questions, Jim? Um, <clears throat> I've done some experimenting with uh, ES six modules, and uh, maybe if I screen share, I, I can show a few things. Mm. Um, I'll just go show you some, some projects. Um, so the, the main thing that people, it, so ES6 modules, they're, they've been coming for a few years in web browsers, um, and they let you um, write ES6 JavaScript. And instead of in Node.js, we do require, you put the NPM name, you can go import, you can import from an HTTPS URL. So it's really, the opposite of package managers. It's, um, but the thing is, like all the JavaScript lives on NPM, so people. Ha so um, there's this uh, CDN service called Unpackage, which allows you to um, use this import syntax via HTTP to the CDN, and then the CDN unpacks all the all the NPMs. So it's sort of exploding all the NPMs out so they all can be referred by um, HTTP. But it's got to do some special little tricks to do it. I don't know if this, there's something in here. But this is the project. Um, and that seems interesting to me because like, if we have all of NPM, we can also un un explode it. And then we'll have like CIDs for each and every little file, which if they're exposed via HTTP, that would just work. Well, so with Unpackage, I think... 22 terabytes, holy moly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, so with Unpackage, it just um, hosts the content. So in order for that one to work, you have to basically, um, as part of your publish step, do a build and then include the build files for browsers in the NPM package. Um, mm. So it, it's a little bit dependent on like you having some tooling up front to do that for browsers. Pika package took a different route, which I see it there, uh, you, you got it up. Um, but they, they're, so their new service is like this HTTP2 interface that um, if you're using import syntax in your raw module, um, it will just pull the, the raw file, there's no build necessary, right? That's why they've been indexing all of the packages that actually do that. <laughs> like yeah. that made no sense until they released this other thing. <laughs> and now that they released this other thing, it's like, oh yeah, it's actually really elegant. Like you don't need a build step for anything. <laughs> Anyways, just the idea of doing raw import over HTTP with the source files in NPM. Mm -hmm. I think that's a powerful idea. Um, there's some related things. So um, Node.js was written by Ryan Dahl, who I used to work with at Joint. And he's doing this new thing called Deno, which is like Node, but he switched the, the characters around. And he's basically saying, no NPM. I hate NPM, um, which is funny because, you know, he, he, he was best friends with Isaac. Um, but uh, his, like his main motivation for doing this project was that he didn't like NPM. <laughs> I know, I know. Like I, but, I, I but talked it, to him when he was starting it. <laughs> but it, 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 it's sort of awesome because it's like um, it would, if we had the raw files. Um, and the other weird thing is he's saying only TypeScript files. Um, but he, there's already an issue on Deno, which he closed, which is saying support for dat IPFS. And they're like, hey. And uh, uh, he's got a great, it says, it says, Oof, not anytime soon. I can conceive of it happening someday, but years in the future. But IPFS is not very good right now, and Deno is not very good right now. We cannot this was dedicate 20... time to that at this point. 
This is 21 days ago. <laughs> so, um, anyways, I, I, I work with Ryan. I like Ryan. So, um, I that, thought that was that, interesting. That, that, uh, when he, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um. I think there's an opportunity there because it's sort of primordial, sort of goo. This project. So I don't know how far yeah. it's going to go, but one one of his complaints is is the immutability issues, right? Like having to resolve like versions and and all of that kind of mess. Um. And he he sort of likes the Go model that you just like pointed at an Earl, but he hates the fact that that's like mutable. Um. So I think that. They get there yeah there could be a, an interesting opportunity yeah um and then um another um what this is an interesting project from uh, uh guys involved with that but he's actually done this for ipfs it's basically like he's he's taken node.js and messed around with the loaders so you can load hg um es6 modules over http directly in, so you can use import syntax on node.js itself so you can uh, use unpackage. Uh, so, and uh, Gozala, Arakli, has actually been using this in his Lunet uh, project. So Isn't that's sort of interesting. Really slow? It's not so bad, like, because it gets cached, like once it's loaded. Right. Maybe the first time it's gonna be a little bit slow, but um, I, I've never seen anybody done really big things. So I've done some experiments with ES6 modules myself on, on the web. Where I like I blew apart like really big packages, and it can get pretty slow. But I put them on DAT, and once everything's you know synced locally, it's not so bad. Like uh, so, I've got some experiments from last year I can show for that. So, I, I mean, I think this is a, a, a somewhere we could go. I, I think another project to mention is uh, a GXJS, which is one of ours, right? So, JavaScript modules too. IPFS. So I don't know how this all fits, but like we have, we're going to have NPM, we're going to have all this uh, JavaScript, and we can sort of blow it apart and publish it immutably. So, but I could drop some of these links into an issue on the project. I don't know if it fits into the scope. Yeah, stick them in the notes for, for this call. Um, that would be really helpful. And this call is also yeah. over time. Oh. Uh, so if you need to drop off. Do, but we can continue chatting for a bit. Talking of GX, I've been looking into uh, and watching some of the threads on, especially on the um, Protocol Labs cluster of Go projects. Uh, lots of people have a lot of pain with it, and it seems like it's also for modules that get used at, that are dependencies of IPFS but get used by other projects as well. They really want to not have that pain and i think the main source of pain is something is is where gx requires every transitive dependency to declare its dependencies as hashes rather than like basically frozen in time versions which means if you want to update any transitive dependency you need to update everything in the chain to be able to get the latest version of a transitive one um so I was going to write up a little proposal, but it's also not clear how much there seems to be different. There's a bit of confusion within protocol over how much GX is like, we, we definitely want to keep using it versus we should just let go modules, uh, like take over and not worry about it. Uh, so I, th I think of making an issue and sticking a, sticking a, um, a little flag in it to be like, Hey, like, should this, be uh, uh, like paid attention to or might might be a good place to uh, to like swing the conversation one way or the other I, I think it's like it's one thing if it's just like you know let's eat our own dog food let's mess with this but like if we're strategically trying to get this actually adopted in a language, um, I think Go, we probably have like the least chance of getting that done. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> the, the, yeah, I mean like, like the, yeah, the Go maintainers, um, <laughs> let's call it uh, hostility <laughs> towards other people trying to solve packages. It's Not like fairly well documented. Years, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah, we, we have like 0% <laughs> like <zero> chance. So. <laughs> yeah. I, think I can see like, if where GX turns into more of a tool for end, users uh, or like end applications web applications written in go where it's a, a snapshot of frozen dependencies in time but it doesn't it actually continues to work with the underlying tool that 
each project has decided to use, which basically is going to end up as Go modules if um, in a very slow kind of like transformative way. It's kind of similar, going to be similar to how Node uh, and the browsers are all moving towards uh, ES6 modules. It's going to always have to have some kind of support for previous things uh, if if uh, some maintainers don't want to get on board straight away or there are dead projects which are still heavily dependent on, um, it's going to take a long time to shake out all the edges of the leaf nodes of that massive graph. Yeah, so I sort of see like GX, GX is pretty much dead internally now because uh, uh, basically <laughs> both GSI or both the Go IPFS and Go uh, libp2p have already moved to the Go modules. So. Uh, but it's like, do we want to keep GX around? Uh, but I think it's it's useful as a learning exercise in a lot of ways in terms of like, you know, if you actually do try to freeze everything in and expose it right to the, like if developers have to deal with hashes and like you check the hashes in and stuff, it just, I, I tried to do some Go stuff with GX and I just kept crashing into it. And yeah, the transitive dependency thing it's really difficult. Go is particularly funny there when you have the import is also like that string contains all the metadata that you're going to say like for that whole module. There's no necessarily until Go modules came along, there was no other files that said anything. You'd need some third party tool to keep track yeah. of uh, the actual revisions that you like known working versions of any of those modules. Um, so then swapping the hash out, you're like, oh, suddenly this means nothing to me. I have no idea of like where the reference point of this is somewhere else. Yeah. Um, it's sort of funny. I don't think IPFS would exist without GX because the, the Go ecosystem did not have the tooling for managing dependencies. And uh, so it's sort of like GX had to be created so you could create IPFS. And it's like the sort of recursive sort of thing. <laughs> but I think it's also instructive because it's it's like I can sort of see like like I'm talking about like these uh, the the sort of unpackaged thing. Like if it's almost like sort of internal build step that you go through and then you you freeze in uh it's like a bundler step in terms of like reducing things to IPFS hashes that are immutable and never gonna change. And they're sort of like you publish like with baked in hashes as opposed to using a, a like a, a runtime resolver to look things up which i think is going to be the approach that most package managers are going to require let me change the subject slightly imagine are you still coming up to london next week yes uh i have it in my calendar to come up on the 14th 15th cool. does that work yeah perfect um it'll be really is your is your uh, bed or sofa available? Um, mine is. Great. And it'd be really useful to try and sketch out some kind of plan going forward so that the other working groups can start doing the like Q2 planning uh, based on the output of this, this working group. Yeah, I mean, so far, there's been everything that I've tried to do has been like, uh, severely limited by performance um, when working with any significant number of um, uh, like downloading. I think if you try and download all the packages for IPFS over GX, it's like 180 total. Uh, it takes a good while to do that. Um, and mm. it's not particularly like just, just the downloading from the DHT without like, um, any with an empty or as good as empty IPFS cache. So, uh, I, I remember, um, so this is like going a ways back, but um, Nojitsu before NPM was a company was sort of running the registry for a minute because they acquired Jason Smith's company that was running the, the NPM registry. And they had built this proof of concept that never got released as a product. But essentially what it did was when you gave it a package version to install, what it would return you was um, basically the computed deep like graph of everything that it needed, right? Um, so it sucked for caching, 
Um, like that was one of the, the main problems. Like you couldn't really give it your local cash um, and you would get back like this giant hardball with stuff that you already had in it. Um, but it was significantly faster than sort of like pulling down that data and then resolving it. And if you look at a lot of the performance improvements that NPM has made since, a lot of it is like, like using the registry metadata before you pull down a package in order to understand the graph, right? Um, I, I wonder like in particular, if we did something that uh, like allowed offline, um, offline ability, you, you could create these really nice cache dates. Um, and then when you give back that cache date as sort of like an IPLV graph, um, it would have you know, references to a bunch of things that you actually could have cached locally. So you could do something that was actually much, much faster for installs um, so in that case. If, if, if we, but it would, it would require like us building up some infrastructure to do. To, to so RubyGems has, uh, has a very elegant solution to that. They have a particular API they had to build for Bundler because as, Bun as RubyGems grew, it got way slower to, to do like download a, a gem, check what the dependencies are, go and uh, do the same work again. And they have essentially, I think it's about a four megabyte file, quite, um, quite like crammed in with information that gives whatever the current state of all versions and all of their dependencies that are published on RubyGems. You can download that file and do the resolution before you go and download any gem. Uh, and they also provide a, a HTTP API to basically go, I want these top level, these 10 top level gems and what dependencies like are uh, all of those things that especially RubyGems has a problem where it has to make sure there's only one version of any one thing, right. but it will return you a full list if it can to go, here is everything that you actually need to do the work. So they basically, dependency resolution as a service um, with the current snapshot of, the, um, of all of those gems. And then if you have your own, say like uh, gems you pulled from GitHub, then it will work those things in by cloning all of your local things or all of our secondary registry things in first mm -hmm. and then using sending that up as like i definitely need to have these versions of these things uh so you'd like extra requirements for your dependency resolution that feels like more package managers could use that to speed up especially um ones like go and swift that are like i need to keep cloning uh <laughs> git repositories uh, until I've, and especially when you're like, oh, get, why am I cloning all of Kubernetes just to pull in this one library embedded inside of it? Uh. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, th this is why I'm, I'm a little bit like more interested in sort of the Docker layer model for what we could do. Because th the interesting thing about these Docker layers is that they, they are immutable snapshot of file systems. So if we have the hash of them, we can effectively say, okay, we have that before we've pulled down any data. And when they try to access the data in that file system, we can give it to them in real time. Um, there, there was like a proof of concept that uh, Matthias Booth wrote on WebTorrent like a long time ago. This is like four or five years ago, um, where he, he wrote a fuse file system on top of WebTorrent um, and would basically mount a Docker image and he would have none of the files and then it would boot and it would be like a half a gig image or something and it would boot in like 10 seconds because the things to boot the Linux image are like a couple megs. <laughs> you just have no idea what those files are <laughs> until you boot it. Um, so we could get like, you know, potentially like insane performance improvements out of, out of things that we, we can treat as a layered file system. Um, theoretically, we could do the same thing with any gzip. It's just like, unbelievably more expensive to do the work up front to unpack those tarballs and turn them into real mm -hmm. file systems. And, and I, I did, I did a proof of concept like earlier um, on top of uh, IPLD Unix MSB2, just looking at like, what, what could we do with deduplication if we were unpacking the gzip? And it turns out that like deduplication does not save you as much space as gzip. So also the data itself that we would be storing would be higher. So that would be problematic. Go cool, Jim. Um, but we really have to draw this meeting to a close. <laughs> okay, Michael, yeah. I, what you're describing is basically what the last thing in my blog is like that I haven't updated in a year and a half is like p called Pipette, which is building off a of work that uh, uh, Max and uh, Matthias were work working on. Uh, whereas, uh, but I, I, I like boot a whole Linux container and then it would load up the blocks over DAT, but then I would just, you, 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 because it gets paged in sparse, I would just like capture what was paged in, and then, uh, then I would like bzip compress it or something like that. 
and then it would turn out like everything you need to boot up a particular Linux image could be packed into like 30 megabytes and, and do like some pretty heavy work. Because most of, most of the stuff in a typical image, like 99% of it's never used. And that yeah. was really interesting because then you can just quit the little zip ball and uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I think we may have reached the end of, end of this meeting. Just a, a quick question, because I, I came late, which is, uh, I, I saw the previous meetings, there's like a link to this is where the videos are in the GitHub issue, but none of them are there right now. So uh, someone who, who missed part of the meeting, I, I'd love to be able to see that. So those can get up, um, that'd be awesome. On a protocol team management repo, there is a PR that hasn't been merged yet, which has the first two meetings. Um, and has a link to the Google Drive that has the recordings in them. We didn't manage to record the last meeting because Alex was snowboarding and the meeting was keyed to his account, unfortunately. Yeah, classic Zoom things. Okay, thank you. <laughs> also, uh, I, I posted an interesting visualization in the metrics repo that I, I posted a link to here, but um, it's just the, the Q4 of 2018's additions to each package manager. Um, and it kind of gives you like a good visualization of the difference in scale between a lot of the different kind of common package managers and how many packages they're adding. Um, also for reference, the last time that I looked at the data for this, um, updates to packages are also happening at a much higher rate in NPM as well. So if, if we wanted to do something like, like Ruby is doing where you, you give all the metadata for the registry state, it would be ginormous um, because it would also have to include all the individual versions. Um, and those are, you know, astronomical. Yeah, npm. Uh, sorry, the the module count is is just top level package names, right? It's not the individual yeah. version counts. Uh, libraries right. yeah, has yeah, a yeah. fairly good count of uh, unique versions as well, so that might be um, an extra data point to add in there. Uh, but yeah, npm is is. Uh, miles away. The other one that's really hard to pin down is Go. Like the numbers are all uh, because you can. Depends what you declare as a package. So in general, all yeah. statistics related to Go package management can just go out the window. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I actually. So module counts for a while was keeping track of GoDoc uh, as a as a package manager number, and so I did a quick analysis, and I was like, this is over reporting by about four times what the actual package count is. <laughs> Just look at Git re repo where I did this analysis. <laughs> yeah, it was like pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. There, there's just there's no way to do anything. Like I think um, we could probably do if we wanted to look at dependencies of a specific package, we could do something with BigQuery to actually query inside of every Go file in every master branch. And that would give us a pretty good picture. Um, that would be like a massive query. <laughs> it would be kind of expensive to run. Um, Ooh, and, and someone's we would have done to that. Make it, so there's, a, yeah. there's a medium post. I'll have to dig it out. Someone has definitely done that before. Um, okay. It might be so funny from the big query team. Yeah, yeah. Well, so so my my issue with it was like I couldn't figure out a way to do it for for more than just one package, right? So if I wanted to look for like um, them depending on something with IPFS in it, like that would be doable. Um, but if you just wanted to like categorize any package and and get like a unique list, I I thought like it looked like you were going to hit the query limit pretty quickly. Um, I think we've gone beyond the realms of yeah. the package managers weekly update so i'm going to stop yeah. recording now uh, and call this meeting to a close but you know feel free to keep going but i've got places to be all right dinner time <laughs> exactly <laughs> bye bye, bye. bye.